Welcome to you all. This is another Music Matters interview to go with the uh, music video that accompanies it. And uh, we're in the presence of a completely reconfigured hall. We've never done a concert like this. We put the instruments and the seating and ourselves where we think the music is going to sound intriguing, engaging, and maybe better. And uh, our panelists showed great fortitude in accepting this suggestion on my part. Closer to the camera, may I present Jayan Sun. Hello. And Judith Gordon. Hi. Welcome, welcome. I think my first question uh, is about the concept of presenting two piano repertoire at all. First of all, it doesn't come your way or any performer's way all that often. And so the audience are not necessarily that familiar with it. Uh, how did the two of you meet, and what first suggested two piano repertoire, or four hands? Well, we were fortunate to meet when Jayanne uh, began to teach at Smith College, mm -hmm. where I also taught until recently. And uh, naturally, one of the things that one does with a fellow pianist is play duets, or naturally to me, one of the things to do with a new, a new piano friend is to read together. And so over the four years that we have been teaching together there, uh, we've had the occasion to learn some fantastic music, and it just felt like a completely normal way to hang out. Um, and so maybe that's... String quartet members are always saying that touring with a quartet tests friendships more than it makes friendships. But my sense of uh, piano duo and piano duet is that it cements friendships. Thoughts, Jayan? Sure, I think so. And uh, it's through the playing together that we get to know each other better and better. And we, we did, we have read a lot over the years, including a, a lot of string quartets. Yes. For a piano for hands. Those beautiful 19th century arrangements. Yes. Which sure. are just to die. Yes. And so we got to know music better, we got to know each other better, we got to know pianos wherever we play better. And so it's, it's a great thing to do. And I have to say that it's a pity when pianists don't get enough opportunities to do that, yes. either in school settings or in professional settings. So, so this is a wonderful opportunity for sure. all of us. And of course there's another way that pianists get to know each other, uh, which is that uh, students and uh, teachers play orchestra and solo mm -hmm. with each other for competitions or for master classes and whatnot. So that's another way. Yes. And then there's Mr. Bach who throws us a very interesting challenge of two equal keyboards mm -hmm. playing a concerto for two solo keyboards, not harpsichords, not clavichords, not organs, not urban pianos, not modern pianos, two keyboards. Mm -hmm. Thoughts? Well, as a fact, most of Bach's keyboard concertos were transcriptions of right. some sort uh, for uh, string instruments or for wind instruments. And in this case, we have a I would say a true keyboard concerto, which was conceived for the keyboard and delivered as such. And um, the version that we present today, which is for two solo uh, keyboards without the orchestra, without the piano, uh, existed uh, as the original version of the piece uh, in the hands of uh, Anna Magdalena Bach. So in a sense, we are not like extrapolating the piece out of the concerto, rather that was the version that Which existed. Which leads to the question, what adaptation, either in the score you're playing or in your own approach to this score, do you make to present that concerto onto con roughly contemporary pianos? These are older instruments, but still contemporary. Mm -hmm. Well, playing Bach on um, modern pianos, it's it's a challenge, but it's also welcome, welcoming opportunity. And I think it's important that in a piece like that, um, that th there's no imperative for us to sound exactly alike. And so it's really a, just the most perfect kind of conversation to have. Um, 
because each time you play it, you, you hear the other person do something different, and you experiment a little bit, and so it's a very dynamic project. It, it's not as if you sit in the rehearsal and make a lot of detailed plans, like that note will be softer and that note will be louder, but really you just are each with your own piano, and so in a way, playing on two instruments with such different character mm -hmm. is almost preferable to playing on two perfectly matched, you know, perfectly matched pianos, because the instrument, it's almost like there's four characters uh, mm -hmm. at work. <laughs> That's <laughs> the, wonderful. Yeah, I it's do. fine. <laughs> Were there that, uh, adaptations of the score necessary, or is what is there perfectly viable on a modern Absolutely, keyboard? perfectly viable. Then we come to a modern man uh, looking at Bach to share with his wife, his piano partner of half a century, and in the second grouping of pieces, you play four hands pieces uh, of Bach chorales as arranged, as envisioned, but still very true to Bach by George Kortok. And what drew you to those pieces? They're irresistible. But, they are. But what drew you to them? They're irresistible. <laughs> and that's how we got to know each other. <clears throat> Uh, for our first public performance. Yeah, four years ago we, we played. Why arrive at Smith? We, are, we participated in the New Music Festival at the neighboring U.S. Um, Amherst uh, Music Department or School of Music, and that's what we presented. Uh, One of the things you were going to do, which I think is going to be very unusual, even for those people who are familiar with two piano and four hands concerts, is that you'll be playing some of the quartet on one piano and some on the other. And I think that that is a fabulous opportunity, not so much to compare the two pianos and say better or worse, but to hear the very different accent mm -hmm. each in once. Yeah, agreed. But then you throw the audience a tough little bagel to chew on, Mr. Buzzoni's Fantasia Contrapuntistica, which <coughs> is an honor to Bach and an honor to a chorale of his and to his fugal work in the murder field. But it is also a thorny piece, and it must have been a thorny piece to study and to bring into performance. And I've talked too much, and our listeners would like to listen to you. It's a, it's a spectacular unicorn of a piece. Um, yes. it, it, it exists in its own world of um, being rarely played, being regarded as something kind of as you speak of it, Monstrous. Like, <laughs> monstrous. Um, but it's really not that way at all. And um, I think that <clears throat> we have found uh, so many opportunities to listen for things in it um, that are, are just so naturally um, persuasive and heartfelt. Um, it's not uh, like the chest beating kind of display. Despite the occasional desolates, it is not mm, just it's it is, it is the, orchestral. But the volume is really more an accumulation of feeling mm -hmm. and um, in, in each of their fantastically distinctive dialects, Kritag and Busoni are both just dealing with the the their own relationship to music of Bach and their own response to it. And Busoni just had a, a <laughs> very rich palette. Yeah, so in both cases, uh, there are explorations and explosions of their inspirations from the music of James Bach. And um, in the case of Busoni, it's often misunderstood as uh, sort of an intellectual game, like how these themes are put together or how many manipulations of the theme we like could Like Yes, exactly. But uh, I would say in these cases, these uh, 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 exemplary uh, pieces, that they are not about the, 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 the intelligence that's as attractive as the perfect combination of you know, in, the, in the sense the understanding of the ideas and this sense of love. 
and the occasional whimsy. Sure. All the emotions that's involved. The two parts are set up. They're not equal, and yet they are of similar vastness or intimacy. Absolutely. But your response to each other are like completions of thoughts. They're like fillings out of the conversation rather than solo verses, solo verses. It's a charming piece once you get to know it. He's so imaginative, though, the way um, each of us has almost all the same material, but just not all in order. So, um, for example, right at the beginning, there's a very striking outburst in one instrument that shows up at the end of a huge section in the other, just like bookends. And so, in, in that way, it's a very beautiful staging of the fact that each person uh, you know, gets a chance at it, just not right in a row. Organizationally, it even yeah. has some of this internal multitude of sections, as does the great organ Masakalia, mm -hmm. including moments when you could, oh, are we at a coda? Or are we about to hit strata that are going to take us off into this direction, etc. It's a magic piece. It's very rewarding. But I think our audience will be hearing that for themselves. And I'll leave with a final comment, which is you've been so gracious as to offer to play our Music Matters Prelude. And I think our audience will be hearing it in a way they have not heard it before. And I have not heard it this way either. So with that, I thank you very much for a wonderful interview. And we'll see you on the concert video. We thank you very much. <laughs>